morning, like Kevin just said, that we had a bit of a glitch and he initially put his laptop up and all of that. And that's true for everybody in the IT department, probably, because they are just amazing. <coughs> Another person we have at Applebee is Calvin Armstrong, who has been in the presentation as well. We've been colleagues for a very long time, around 17 years now. And uh, we've had uh, technology at the school for over 18, 19 years. Uh, Calvin actually, <coughs> what I say about Calvin Armstrong, he's a director of innovation and technology. I always tell people, and he laughs when he hears that, is that if anybody has a question on EdTech, you might go on Google. At Applebee, we have Calvin Armstrong. So I just want to thank him at the beginning. And thank you, Strategy Institute, for inviting me today. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure and an honor to be here and talking to all my colleagues and peers here. It's wonderful. So, um, Kevin was there when I was at TEDx, um, and uh, he was there to support me, and we had a web class with the school, so it was all good. But today I'm going to talk about something really relevant to the lives of all educators, which is actually <coughs> delivering meaningful learning outcomes, because that's the key to our jobs and our profession, but by using innovative technology. I am not a big fan of using jargon, so I'll talk really in very simple terms, and you're welcome to raise your hand and ask questions at any point of time. At, at Flight, I'll try to put some time at the end if you have any questions. So um, here we start. So this is a picture of one of my one of my best students there. And I just put up the graph there to show how we use some of the ways we use technology. So I'll be talking about that. So it's a very challenging time for educators today and I think most of you would agree with me. Because up till now, our only, previously when the computer technology was not in our classes, our only job was to deliver the curriculum, use a textbook or some references, or just what we learned in our own classes. But now, things have changed. We cannot be deliverer of knowledge, only knowledge anymore, because that is available to our students from a lot of resources. There are a number of resources that they can go to and get videos, e-texts, and all the websites from where they could learn and get all the knowledge. So what is our job now? I believe that our job is to be the bridges. We have to be bridges between the curriculum and what they can learn. And the bridge is where the technology comes in. And that bridge just cannot be anything. It has to cater to what the student needs and what, not what we want to do or what we are required to do. And this is why at Applebee, all the things that we use are student-centered. It has to be student-centered. We just cannot say, okay, Facebook is there, so let's use Facebook for a project. I have never done that. My colleagues don't do that. We always look at the requirement of the project or what our students need, and that is from where we go. We go backwards. So this is how the technology should be used, and I, took, I truly believe in that. It is an increasing digitized world for sure. I'll give you an example of how we use I use technology in my classes. We have been at e-school, like I've said, for a very long time, and we all have lap laptops, the students and teachers. I consider myself very, very fortunate because everybody does not have that opportunity. So what I have done, for example, when I was doing a, I'm a physics teacher, so when I was doing a projectile experiment or other experiment, I always felt that students are never able to see the flight of a projectile. Or if they are doing a circular motion experiment, they are never able to see how the object is moving. It's a very simple thing, and some of you might have done that in your own classes. And I went to my IT executive director at that time, and I said, I want to show my students, we have cameras now, how, how can I do that? Because even if I picture it with a camera, it will just show a flight, it will not be able to show them. And trust me, there was no video analysis software to my knowledge, or even with some companies who have them now. He actually searched and told me about the software called Dashish. And he said the, only, the athletes use it to analyze their own play. So we got that, 
and we used it, and since then, and then of course the video analysis software came out, and we had, but we did not go backwards. We didn't say, oh, video analysis software is out now, let's use it for the classes. We never did that. We looked at the students' need and that's where we went. Another example that we have is that when our, our students are away from classes for athletic service and also our um, athletic service and arts activities, and also for academic uh, things, they're uh, away on trips or from excursions. And in 2004, which is a very, very long time back, we said that we need them, we need to support them when they come back to class and they've missed it. In those times, the video technology was not very, very good. So what we did is we put, we made PowerPoints and we did sound files in those. And when the students came back, they could hear us talking, they could see, say, have, like not just have a flat document or a PowerPoint, but actually something that they could hear and understand and follow through. Later on, of course, we made videos in 2004 and 5, which has the write-out and the write-over and the voice-over and everything, and I'll, I'll share those with you uh, in a minute. <clears throat> so now, all of us, most of us must have heard about the critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. And I think most of us know this. These are called the 21st century skills. But these have a broader meaning. One thing we have to do is first understand them. And I truly believe that for critical thinking, logical thinking is also very, very necessary. And this is why coding is very important for students to learn from a very early stage. So there are two aspects to technology in education. One of them is digital literacy, how to use technology for our purpose. And the second part is coding, which is logical thinking. So critical thinking has to go hand in hand with logical thinking. And that only comes from learning science, technology, and of course math is very, very important. I'm not just saying it because I'm a science teacher or I'm, or I'm good at math, but because I, I know for sure that once a student can learn how to think logically and critically analyze what they are reading, they will be becoming, they will become better citizens of this world. And this is why I think coding is becoming more and more in, in thing as I call it in schools now. It's very, very important. Of course, communication skills are important, but I want to actually focus on one more thing, which is collaboration and sharing. Sharing is not in the four C's, but I think it should be there. The reason for that is I'm sharing my ideas with you today, and when I meet you, you will be sharing them with me. And I think that's really crucial for educators and any professional for that matter. And this is what we have to teach our students to do. We have to be role models that we share freely. We are collaborating with our peers. We are collaborating with our students to become better people and also to learn the curriculum at the same time. The last one we know very well is creativity. How can we instill creativity in our students? We have to instill it in ourselves first. It's not very easy to do that. And the reason why I'm saying this is because it requires courage. I cannot emphasize this enough, that courage and open-mindedness. We do talk about courage, but can you think if we don't have an open mind to listen to people, and we don't have an open mind to adapt what we see or learn from others, it's not easy to take to have the courage and to get all the four C's in place that we just talked about. So the teachers, as educators, I believe in being open-minded. I think most of the things that I have learned personally is from other people and by being open-minded and also listening to them and trying to see how it fits in my daily life as a professional and as a person. And I think when we start doing that, our students get that. It's a very sharing, collaboration, open-mindedness, communication. All of these are very infectious, or I should say, 
they just students when they see you do that and when you talk about that to them they just feel more comfortable the reason i say courage is because you should have teachers should also have courage to make mistakes in their classroom because unless that's the best lesson you can give them students are afraid to raise their hand and technology helps them just write things in their own notebooks and show it to them but at the same time that requires courage and open mindedness I want to focus on courage a little more by giving an example of the EdTech company. Can you imagine what Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg's parents must have thought or said when they said that they want to drop out of Harvard and do their own startup? Must have been hard. But they and other people had the courage to take that step. Jeff Bezos actually left a lucrative job in Wall Street. He had a family and he started Amazon. Courage is required to do things, a lot of courage. And I'll tell you a story of my own son in my own home. I like to tell these stories because I like to talk simple, like I said. My son was worked for Microsoft and then he worked for Facebook. And one day he came to us and said that he wanted to leave his job because he wanted to do a startup. Trust me, I was not happy. I was not open-minded to that, I can tell you. I asked him, I said, when things are going so well for you and the company is treating you so well, why do you want to leave your job? And you know, the, what he told me just blew my mind. And I, I related to myself too. He said, I don't want my progress to hinder in my progress. I don't want my progress to hinder in my progress. Wow. I said, this is what happens to each one of us in our classes. We are acting that things are going well. We think the students are learning and everything is going well. We are able to finish all the curriculum. Why should we do anything new? We actually do exactly that. We do that all the time. And this is why we have to have an open mind. We have to have the courage to try new things, make mistakes, and learn from them and move forward. Then going back to saying we are role models for our students. We need to be like that so that they can learn to get those four C's with courage and not be afraid at all in our classes. Courage to take risks. <clears throat> but the other thing that happens to each one of us is it's not easy to convert. So, for example, if I want to start something new in my school and with my colleagues and my peers who are teaching the same course, it's not easy to convince them. It's not easy to convince your peers and your administration. I'm lucky, I'm one of the lucky few who get all the support from the admin and IT and my colleagues, but everybody may not be very lucky or fortunate as I am. And I know it requires a lot of convincing and examples to tell people that they are able to do this. The other thing that's important is that being a teacher in today's time, or being an educator in today's time, is very, very challenging. I think all of us know that. I, I, I have that generation gap up there. Generation gap used to be parents and children. But as teachers, and with technology, and even the parents, have that challenge of the generation gap. An example I will give you is that I have two sons. My older one loves to talk on the phone. The younger one hates to talk on the phone. So I used to get very frustrated because he would never call me or talk to me. The older one would do that. And I asked my older son, why don't you tell him to call me sometimes? And he said, mom, they're four years apart, and he said, mom, we have a generation gap. I said, you do have a generation gap? He said, yeah, I'm an email generation and he's a text generation. Can you imagine? 
exciting for us teachers. Every year we are getting new types of students in our schools. We have to, how do we keep up with them? Because every year is a generation gap. Now, even for our own selves, there is a generation gap. We need to keep up with that. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. And I totally sympathize with that. So this is something I tweeted some time back. And I just, um, as you read it, in a dynamic tech environment, being digitally literate is a moving target and challenge for teachers and students. How many of you agree with this? Okay. I think most of you, all educators, would surely agree with this. At our school, something really interesting has happened. Learning has replaced teaching. Apple, in, at Apple, the change is the status quo. And that is why it's a scary environment for a new person who goes there. But one who survives knows this is true. We have been, we started with laptops, then we went to having a pen laptop. So if I show you, I can write with a pen on this one. So we have all our notes and I'll share them with you today. Then we got OneNote. After my family and friends, OneNote is my third love. I cannot, I have been using it for over 10 years. I cannot imagine how people do without it. It's on my phone. I have my notes here. When one of you is speaking, I'll be taking your picture or your slide. I'll be putting in my notes and everything will be coming on my laptop automatically. My whole life is in one note. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that all the students and teachers at the school are learners. All of us are learners. The, we teach the students and we learn first to teach them too. So we've gone from a school of teachers and students to a school of learners. That is what is so different. We are student-centered and we are all learners. We just dive in things. We just dive in. And then see, okay, this is good. This is really good. And then we try them out for a project for our students. And there we go. And thank you to Microsoft. We are actually a Microsoft Showcase school now. And I'll share with you the wonders of OneNote that we have created. The other thing that the teachers have been with, and that, that's true for technology as well, is all of the lists that I have there. Normally you might think that culture is the only diversity. I have put technology up there. Why do you think it is there? Because every student in class is at a different level of that skill. And we need to deal with that. If we are, whether I'm doing a video analysis experiment or I'm asking them to make a PowerPoint or a video or a website, or I'm just asking them to use OneNote, or just put up a file on OneNote, or retrieve the file that I have put there. If a student is new or not been there for a long time, each one in my class of 15 or 16 is at a different level. Although the students are very good to learn and all of us experience that in our classes, but there are certain things that we need to deal with because of those levels and the diversity of learning technology. So we have to be very calm and mature about these things. I'm never afraid to learn from my students. So if I am introducing a new technology and my students get that before me, or when I show it to them, for example, we were actually doing a wave nature of light experiment and they had to see those um, uh, the fringes there. And I said, okay, talk about these fringes, draw them and draw them on your laptop report, lab report. One of them takes out the phone camera and takes pictures and that's how he is back. And instead of actually drawing, he took the pictures and put them in the lab report. Since then, I tell all my students to do that. They feel excited pictures are amazing, they learn more from them, and some of them have taken a video to see how it moves, the spectrum moves in the fringes. 
still don't go, they have a full time. They have the ways, they have to study the ways and change frequency and things. They take a video camera to see how the wave is changing. I, can, I always showed them the different times to see how the wave changes in frequency, but now they are able to take a video, go back home, discuss it with their partners and the lab partners, and also analyze what they have seen in their classes. I don't have to remind them what they saw yesterday because they have it with them. So technology can be really amazing, but then, we have to remain calm. If they tell us something, we have to accept. We have to think about it. We have to not be afraid of accepting it. So I think to myself, because I learned from my students, I'm a continuous learner, I think of myself not as a teacher anymore. If you go to my LinkedIn page, you will see that I'm a facilitator for learning now. With technology, we cannot be one who is just imparting knowledge. It has to be a collaborative and technology really helps us with that. I am a facilitator. And I think that is very, very helpful for me because it is a requirement now, I think, that for teachers these days. So now, however, and I think I, think I said that at the beginning, and I truly, truly believe in this, that just using technology is not a 21st century skills. How you use it. You have, we have to use technology to develop the four C's and the other things that I talked about, like the courage, the open-mindedness, the sharing, and all the four C's that we just talked about. <clears throat> I want to focus on short sharing once more because that's where uh, using technology comes in. The reason I talk about sharing is because sharing and collaboration is the key. When we made our videos for our classes, like some of us in the school have voiceover and writeover videos for every topic that we teach in the class. And we did that in 2005, which was a very long time back, but we made a mistake. We did not share it with anyone. We just because we didn't think we were doing anything great. We just did it because our students needed them. And we thought when they come back from their trips, they have it for themselves. They can get ready for class. They can review it, uh, review it before their test and all of that. And can you imagine what Salsan did? All of you know Salsan? How many of you know Salsan? Most of you. If you don't, please look up for him. Salsan Academy. He is actually, uh, he is an MIT engineer and a Harvard MBA. And he has, he started making these videos for his own nephew. And it became a revolution in education. The point is that he shared it with the world. Now he has SAT prep with college board, he has LSAT prep, everything on his website. It is one of the most amazing things that have happened. He has the knowledge up there for the students. So if we could use that, students use my video for their classes, but I always tell them to use that as well. We can do other stuff in class. We can actually go from that lower step of knowledge and just do stuff above that. I'm just looking at the time. I think I'm almost... Uh, so how do we use technology? I was looking at this video by Peter Killen, and I'm sorry, I, I don't think I have time to show it, but if you, if you are interested, uh, I can share this with you. He actually talks about something interesting. He, I, I saw it actually last week, and I thought I could share it with you. He says that when you are using technology, you should actually observe what happens to students after that. And he talks about using Word and the outline view. He says when you are asking students to use a Word document, they are writing an essay. But if you show them the outline view, it trains their mind to think in that way. So they make the outline, they prepare themselves to write the essay. Even if they don't have word after that, and if they're writing with pen, they will think in the same way. And that, was, that is profound. Because whatever we teach them about technology in our classes, it should be used so that the outcome is 
what they get out of using that technology. It's just not about using technology, but also about how they use it. So I want to share with you um, this one note, and I want to show you how we use that in our classes. It's not showing up there, I'm sorry. Windows Explorer or whatever folder you have, this one has all the folders embedded in them. So this is not my from laptop like uh, Kevin just said he shared it with me, but this is how I have everything. Uh, my whole life is on the left side. Everything that I have is there. This is one of our class notebooks that we use. This is where we do our planning. And can you see the links in those planning pages? So if I just if I give a homework or a classwork, I they click the link and they go to the page of where they have to do the work. So that's the first thing. This is where I put all my stuff in. This page and the course planning we call the CP page is only readable for students. But the other teachers can share them. The other teachers can share them. But for students, it is only so they can copy pages from here in their own notes, but they cannot edit it. However, every student has their own section. So if I look at the student section, and I look at his notes, so it's not printing yet because it's with Kevin's laptop, but can you see that, can all of you see the M, A, R, A, and R folders up there? Can all of you see it from there? So A folder is the one where they put in their assignments, and then I take them to the mark M folder where I mark them, and they cannot see them when I'm marking. And after I mark them, I put them in the R folder. Can you see from here? I think no, you can, right? Pretty much. No. It's not showing up? It's not okay, please, sorry. We're running out. So, going back, I'm almost done. So, so this is how the one more looks for us. And if you want to learn about this, the other technology that I use is Skype. I used to use Adobe Connect before to share my screen and to do extra classes for my AP students. Now I use Skype for business. Of course, video analysis I already talked about. And then a lot of students actually, we do hybrid simulation video teaching. Some of the projects, if you want to see them, I can show them to you later. And this is where I leave you. Because when technology started improving our classes, we were worried that will it replace us? But I want to end with the note that it will not. Teachers will always be needed. Educators will always be needed. Technology just helps them. Thank you.